Hello, welcome to the online part of uh, this book launch. Um, thank you for coming. If there's anybody out there, I'm glad to be speaking to you. Um, I'm sure some of you still arrived at the uh, at the forge in Newmarket, despite me trying to explain it to everybody that it was an online launch. Uh, and I can see you're already clicking in and joining. So welcome to Lee Watkins and, and welcome to Scott Moores. Um, the quiz is already un underway, so you can have a look at the quiz and have a go. We've given you four easy questions, and I mean easy questions. Uh, so you've got a really good chance of winning uh, guess what? Um, uh, here's the clue what the prize might be. Yes, it's the hoof of the horse. That's going to be your prize for the quiz. So have a go. It's a free quiz. It costs you nothing. And it's just the person with the four best uh, answers. Yes, evening, Lee. Hello, Gareth uh, Schofield. Rick Bramucci from Australia has already joined us. Tina Husby. I'm sorry if I don't always pronounce some of these names uh, from Oz. And Andrew Thompson has joined as well. I'm not going to keep doing this um, because I'll go on forever because you are coming in quite quickly to this party. Um, I haven't got the drink out yet, but I'm sure I will later. Um, I'm sure you're all going to enjoy a whole bottle of virtual champagne with me. Anyway, the whole thing is about this, but I'm going to start by answering some of the, um, the questions. And let's see, what have we got? <clears throat> right at the very start, I've got Jeff who asked, who is this book aimed at? Well, of course, it, that is a good general question to start with because when you write a book, uh, you have to at all points have a vision of who you're writing for. So I did write this primarily for hoof care professionals. And of course, that as a, as a farrier, I am a hoof care professional. Um, there are other people who look after the hoof who do not shoe horses. I'm quite happy with them to use the book. Um, I take a neutral view on things and I hope everybody enjoys it. Um, all my books, previous books, have sold very well to vets, so I hope they, they buy this. And of course, uh, very interested horse owners, and we've already had orders from horse owners who are, who are interested in their foot. Um, I'll tell you later about how the way I think you should read this book and view it. Um, but Ramu from India, uh, who's a good Facebook friend, who's the only vet I know uh, in India that both makes horseshoes and, and puts them on. And some of you might remember the Forge magazine uh, where I took pictures of him and he was on the front cover a number of years ago. He says, uh, if you can tell us as to what we should be doing differently based on your thesis works. Well, that's a big, big thing. And I'm the last person in the world to start telling people exactly how I think uh, they should be showing the horse. But the, the point of the book is that it's a knowledge book and there are a lot of new findings in it. And I, I think the people that will buy it uh, make up their own decisions. Um, so I'm not saying you necessarily do things differently. I think you'd learn uh, about how the hoof works quite well and, and that might influence the way you trim and shoe. Uh, for example, my, my big finding in my thesis really was that hoof compressed as it grows. So as the hoof descends down the, down the hoof wall, it's actually being compressed. Um, and I don't think that surprised, would be surprising to many people who, who work a lot with hooves because we see the effects of that. But the point is now that we know that scientifically, and we know that therefore one side of the hoof might compress more than the other as it grows down, it means that if we can alter the compression, then we can get a more um, symmetrical hoof. And symmetrical hooves have been shown in science uh, to be more sound than unsymmetrical hooves. Again, I don't think that's... A, a great surprise to those of us that have shod and trimmed horses for a long time. Uh, Demelza asks, and Demelza Rowland this is, and I don't know whether Demelza is with us yet. I had a list coming up of 
of, uh, of people that were joining, but I can't scroll down. Um, Demelza's horse is the one, uh, the, hoop, the hoof that's directly behind, sorry, this shoulder, this shoulder. Um, that's uh, Demelza's horse, so of course she's very uh, proud of her horse and, um, and very interested in this whole process. So Demelza says, what are underrun hills and what can be done to help them or treat them? Well, of course, this is a question, isn't it, that's intrigued us all for, for many long years. Um, an underrun heel is one where the angle is, is very acute. Um, I've heard people define it as less than the, the dorsal hoof wall. Well, all even healthy hooves, the, the heel angle is less than the dorsal hoof wall. So it has to be quite a bit more than that. And I think if we need, if we want numbers, then 10 degrees more acute um, is probably a way of defining what is a underrun heel. So underrun, I think there's two things going on with our hoof. Both the hoof is bending, and we can see that curvature in the hoof wall. Um, I hate it when people say you can see that the horn tubules are bending. Well, it isn't just the horn tubules, everything's bending. The only reason we can see it usually is because of pigmentation in the hoof. So uh, all of the hoof wall at the heel is bending under and it's probably compressing as well. Uh, the the add-on to this question is also uh, what can be done to help them or treat them? Well, we could do a whole night on this, couldn't we? A whole, a whole hour long um, podcast. But the main thing, of course, is uh, to try and improve that angle and to unload the heels. And there's a lot of ways of doing that. Um, okay, uh, Robbie Miller from South Africa. And uh, I think Robbie has, uh, has loaned me or has, has given me one of the pictures that appears in the book. He had a really nice radiograph of a club-footed horse. And, and I'm pleased to have put that in. And anybody that supplied me with a picture, I did put their name uh, their name underneath it um, to recognize their contribution. So Robbie sent me one and I asked to use it and I've used that. Anyway, his question is not on club feet. Uh, he says, having a good understanding of how the hoof functions is a prerequisite for farriers. Will this book put to bed a lot of the often ludicrous ideas being thrown around by hoof care specialists? Well, um, I, I would have to say when when we disagree with somebody um, quite vehemently, then we can think their ideas are ludicrous. Uh, to them, they're probably not so ludicrous. But um, I hope that I've applied science and I've applied um, a neutral view to what I've found, and also not just what I've found in my thesis. This book also uh, it, it, I, I've tried to bring together um, what is current scientific thinking. I think what Robbie is probably alluding to is that for the last 20 years, we have been told that a hoof wears naturally in the wild in a certain way, and we should um, replicate that both with our trim and shoeing. Um, but of course, that has been shown to be uh, not true uh, since the work of uh, Brian Hampson and Chris Pollitt. And so I come back to that quite a bit in my book, and I... I think people have to be more reasonable about feral horses and the way their, their hooves wear. And hoof wear really is only a combination of um, exercise undertaken uh, and the substrate. So in other words, how far they go and what is underneath their feet, whether it's very abrasive or whether it's soft, whether they only have to go a couple of kilometres a day or whether they have to go as some of the feral horses in Australia, 15 kilometres. Um, I always think we should learn from nature, but we shouldn't be uh, so, um, what should we say, uh, radical about it or so obsessive that, that we stop seeing um, everybody else's view. So I, I think we should all have a think about that. Uh, it, does, it does form quite a big part of the book. Um, I went to uh, an area quite close to me where we have free ranging conics. Um, and John Blake, who some of you might know, is, uh, is the farrier that occasionally trims horses there. And, and I've used those in, the, in my book to illustrate what happens to feral horses when they're in a 
non-abrasive um, environment. So I hope that helps. Um, if you wonder why I keep looking over to my left, uh, it's because I do have a list of the questions here and it's far easier for me to see them. Uh, I'm sure there's some more popping up at times. Um, so let's have a look. Uh, we have another one from South Africa. We've got uh, Ian Pope and Ian used to work here in Newmarket where I am. Uh, he's moved back down to his homeland. Um, I'm just having a bit of a scroll at who's coming on and I'd have to say it's, uh, it's almost overwhelming. Uh, at the moment I'm just whelmed, hopefully later on I'll be overwhelmed, uh, but we've got quite a lot of, uh, uh, of people joining us and I've got an additional question. But first of all, I'm going to answer what uh, Ian asked, since I said that Ian's asked a question, and he said, what made you or drove you to write another book? Um, well, in some ways, um, what drove me to write a book was examining um, apprentice farriers here in the UK. And, you know, we, we do have a very good educational system here. And our top students are quite remarkable. They know so much. You ask them to draw the um, nerve supply of the, of the, uh, of the lower leg. Uh, they will do it beautifully. Uh, if you ask them to do all the tendons and ligaments, they'll name every other, every single tendon, every single ligament. They'll do a cross section through them. They'll tell you how they work. They'll tell you everything about them. You say to them, so how does the hoof grow? And the mouth drops open and you can see they, they really don't know. They haven't thought about it. So it struck me that this is crazy. As, as a farrier, every day I have horse's hooves in my hands. The thing that we should know most about, I think, is the hoof. That's our primary source of concern. Now, of course, I'm one of the people I would like to think that helped extend farrier knowledge uh, further up the leg and, and, and try to explain how, as farriers, we can affect um, the leg. And it's important to know that. But... This made me think maybe I need to come all the way back to just the hoof. So the whole book is just written on the hoof capsule. And of course, when I started uh, planning it and, um, and making notes and thinking about how it would be organized, um, what the chapters would be, what the subjects would be, for the first uh, month or so, I thought, I'm not sure whether I'll have enough material for a whole book. But as you can say, as you can see, Never mind the, the quality, feel the thickness, as, as the tailors used to say. So there was enough uh, to have 200 pages and I think 250 pictures or something um, just about the horse's hoof. Now, of course, the book has to talk about the connective tissue, the lamellae, and the tendons uh, that have an effect upon, upon the hoof and its shape. But I tried to keep that brief. I really tried to make this book uh, just about the hoof capsule alone. Um, so I hope when you read it, you'll agree with me that uh, there is enough known about the hoof capsule for it to deserve a book all on its own. Now, uh, Lindsay uh, St. George, who was a fellow student of mine, uh, uh, up at the University of Central Lancashire. Lindsay says, hi, Simon, congrats on another book. Obviously, I'm not a farrier, so I'm just wondering who your target audience is for this book. Well, I think I've already answered that, Lindsay. I hope that satisfies your question. Um, uh, it's anybody who is seriously interested in the hoof. Um, I think from uh, farrier's point of view, uh, there's obviously a real... Um, need, I think, for farriers at a higher level to have this book. The other thing, if I can, if I can say about it, it is genuinely just a knowledge book. And you might say, well, all books bring knowledge, but I think the um, important thing is not that it just uh, brings knowledge, is that you then disseminate this information and decide how you use that knowledge. So I've, I've tried not to impose anything on anybody. Um, uh, when there was a question earlier about hoof trimming, I, I tried to think about the four different ways 
uh, that uh, hooves are trimmed. And I'm not going to go into that in detail because you'll have to you'll have to look at that. And um, and even on the part we have a whole chapter on shoeing. But I'm not saying how you should shoe a horse. Uh, what I'm saying is what happens to the hoof when you shoe it? What are the advantages and what are the disadvantages? And I think anybody who's open-minded would see that they're both of those. But if we use the advantages of shoeing a horse and we know about the disadvantages, we can probably mitigate them a little bit and therefore uh, improve our shoeing. So that's the way I view the book. Uh, the information's there. Um, but it's really for you to use this information in the best way that, that you think you can. All right, I'll see if I can find another question. Um, Meg Bennett, and I know Meg's in California. Um, I don't know whether she's listening in, but I hope she is. Meg says, has research into the equine hoof brought us any closer to interrupting or stopping the painful and damaging manifestation of laminitis? Well, um, this isn't a cop-out. I'm not really the person to ask on that exactly, although obviously, as, as with everybody else, I maintain an interest in, in laminitis, this, this terrible degree, the disease, I should say, or disorder of the connective tissue, uh, which actually causes the second most deaths uh, in the equine world. So it's something that, that the more we know, the better. Um, when When... Meg asks about stopping laminitis. Of course, there was quite a lot of work done uh, with cryotherapy. And, and um, I know Chris Pollitt showed that you could slow the process. I'm not sure if he slowed you, showed that you can stop it. And I'm not sure how much further that has got. But uh, we still don't understand the exact process um, and pathways that, that um, laminitis takes and of course we know that some horses uh, founder by rotation some founder by sinking uh, there's there's all sorts of degrees of severity and what we sometimes forget is that actually most horses survive laminitis it's what it does to the hoof when they've survived and what what are we left with and what's the horse left with and how do we hope help them cope so uh, I'm sorry uh, to disappoint Meg if she was waiting there for the answer to laminitis. I don't have it. Um, let's hope that research continues and one day we do have a really clear answer to that. Um, Rick Bramucci, uh, also from Australia. And uh, uh, Rick, I know you're there. So uh, at least online, I can congratulate you in, on winning one of our quizzes last year, you won a copy of Folder Racehorse. Um, I remember being cursed at by my team of workers that, that it cost far more to send it out to you than anywhere else, but we were delighted to send it to you and you put a nice picture online uh, showing yourself reading it. Um, so thanks for that, Rick. Uh, so you got the chance to win another quiz since you are obviously one of these people that, that does well at quizzes so i hope you're answering the questions now be a bit embarrassing if you win again but if you give the best answers then of course uh, we're going to um uh, we're going to send you that book um so and i know you've put a couple of questions in rick so we're going to ask this one and then we're going to look at some others and i might come back to your list um rick asks have you found any correlation between P3 fractures in foals and the use of lateral extensions? Do you think that extensions are, cap are capable of causing this? Rick, thank you for asking a question that's got nothing to do with the hoof of the horse. Actually, that's not strictly true, but of course we're talking P3 fractures and my book is about the hoof. But um, my experience is that I think it would be difficult to deny that there's a risk that when you put an extension on, that uh, you don't increase the chance of there being a wing fracture to P3. But there's an interesting paper, and I can't remember the author, <clears throat> but I know it shows that 70% of foals have fractures during maturity, or during maturation, sorry, not during maturity. As they mature, they have that number of fractures. So here's the thing. If you put an extension on, there's quite a big chance of a fracture. Um, I think there's ways to put extensions on to reduce the risk, but I'm certainly never going to say that there is absolutely no chance of causing 
fracture in the hoof uh, when you put an extension on. I think you need to explain to the clients and they shouldn't let the foal gallop around a five hectare uh, paddock. In fact, what it should be in is, is restricted exercise. So really a little nursery paddock or a barn because um, that helps the condition of, of, of the angular limb deformity that is, is almost certainly why you've got an extension on. So I hope that helps answer um, <coughs> your, uh, your question. Uh, let's go on to Florian. <coughs> Excuse me. Let's just have, look, champagne's not out yet. Just water. Well, I am working, even at this party I'm working, but I hope you're having something uh, that's fun. Um, please don't send me the bill, the drinks bill at the end. So Florian Hefner, who's a good friend of mine, and most of you would know by now that he's taken over uh, the Farrier's Journal in Europe, and he does that wonderful magazine, which comes out in six languages. So Florian asked the question, uh, did you find that there are weak spots in horses' hooves which are especially prone to, to have or cause problems. Uh, and then he goes on, if so, where, how, when do we typically help and where do we typically worsen as far as well? I think I could write a whole book on that question, couldn't I? Um, weak spots in horses' hooves. Well, of course, the one that um, uh, often catches people's eyes is, the, is this little CD area right at the point of the toe, and of course it's in the same area as the uh, crena, which is, is, is the little curve uh, or the little notch in the tip of the pedal bone. Um, and therefore I think the lamellia are quite uh, distended at that point, and so we get that. So that's, that's a weak spot, and of course there is some suggestion that that's a spot where we can get um, a keralytic disease which destroys uh, the internal horn, um, you know, sometimes called CD toe, hollow hoof, uh, mis miscalled or the misnomer of uh, white line disease, but we'll let that one go for the moment. Um, so it allows the access for those microbes uh, and we get a weakness that extends there. So that, that's definitely a weak spot. Um, you might say that the heels of the hoof are weaker uh, than the dorsum, the toe, which of course is down to a number of things. Uh, firstly, the hoop wall is thicker at the dorsum by a considerable amount. Um, but if you think it's more, it's, it has a better attachment to the bone, to the distal phalanx, so it, so it is more supported. When you get um, past the, the quarters, of course, the hoof is not actually attached to anything that is even semi-rigid. So, so this is, um, uh, what should we say, a fault in the, in the design of, of, the, of the hoof capsule. Um, it's necessary to allow expansion and contraction to allow a lot of movement, but it also means there's a weakness. We had a question earlier about collapsed heels, and that's one of the outcomes of having uh, less support to the hoof capsule in that area. Um, ah, see, this is a long question. Where, how, and when do we typically help, and where do we typically worsen as farriers? I'm not going to start blaming farriers for everything. I'm not sure uh, what we worsen as such if, if we do a good job. I think, obviously, um, however well you shoe, putting a nail into the hoof wall uh, must be damaging it by its nature um, and possibly allows. Uh, access to microbes. Uh, of course, we have recently had some uh, some movement on, on copper-coated nails. Um, we can't quite say the jury's still out on that because actually um, there's already been one paper studying it and it has seemed to show that uh, copper-coated nails do at least reduce bacterial content. I've got a nice picture in, my, in, in uh, the hoof of the horse. Um, showing that, and that was kindly given to me by uh, Carl Bettison. He sent it to me and allowed me to use that because I didn't have a good one of my own. Now, I'm going to get your name wrong here, Isabella. Not Isabella, but um, the, your surname. Uh, Elk Jar, I'm going to go for. Uh, and <clears throat> Isabella says, Hi, Simon. Want to become a farrier, 
I don't know where to start. Do you have any advice? Uh, the, I don't know which country you're in, Isabella, um, but uh, from the point of view of the UK, and I guess this is true everywhere, is the first thing to do is ask around and find a good farrier and talk to them. I think the second way, uh, whichever country you're in, is don't take no for an answer. You know, say to them, uh, if you're still at school, say, oh, come on a Saturday. I don't mind sweeping up. I'll hold horses for you. Just let me come and prove myself. And when they say, I don't really want an apprentice, say, yes, but just let me come and help you uh, because you can recommend me to somebody else. So that would be my best advice to you, Isabella, is don't give up. I know, sadly, still we are still in a world where it is more difficult uh, for, for women to get a job as a farrier. But that has been changing and it's changed a lot in my lifetime. Although to put it in perspective, uh, my grandmother a um, hundred years ago wasn't unknown. Uh, it wasn't unknown for her to help out in the forge. So uh, women have always been involved, but they haven't been involved quite as much as they are now. So I can say good luck to you on your uh, attempt to get training. That's the advice. Find, find a, a good farrier and, uh, you know, make use of their knowledge and their opportunities and, and get their advice. They'll know the local situation far better than me. Now, <clears throat> I have uh, uh, a question from uh, Amy Barstow, and Amy's down at the uh, Rural Veterinary College where they've done a lot of work on, on the horse's foot and motion and imaging. And, um, and Amy's been part of that team for quite a long time, and I know she is getting towards the end of her PhD, so, we've, so we're gonna wish her good luck with that PhD. Uh, and she says, what was your favorite chapter to write, and how did you find the motivation to write a book after writing a PhD thesis? <clears throat> well, I think the thing is, um, Amy, is that inevitably, I devoted so much time uh, to getting my PhD. Monday used to be what I called my academic day. Um, I, uh, I'd set that aside. Obviously, that wasn't enough, just one day. But um, what with uh, uh, setting aside Monday, a couple of evenings and what have you, they, uh, I used that time to get my PhD. But I was in such a mode, it took so long, that, of course, when I finished, I was at a little bit of a loss. Um, and... Uh, I would say for the last year, this had been sort of building in my mind to uh, do, a, uh, do a book out of my PhD thesis. I could see that, that, that my thesis fitted into the middle section. So, so when I say that it, um, this, this book, The Hoof of the Horse, uh, is based on my PhD, then um, it's actually the, the middle part is based on it, on the development of the hoof and the things that happen to a hoof while, while the foal was developing. Um, I learned an awful lot about the hoof uh, during that time, a lot that I didn't use in my thesis. That's the whole point of doing a PhD, that you learn a lot of peripheral knowledge. And, um, and so that's really used for section one and section three of the book. Uh, by the way, I just wanted to do this and catch the light. I hope you can see that this book is actually gold. So uh, the poster behind me is not gold because gold is very difficult to do uh, in many printing forms, uh, but you can see this is actually a golden book. So it's about the golden hoof all the way through. Um, so that, that was where I got my motivation. I think my motivation as well was uh, this need, as I say, to bring together as much knowledge about the horse's hoof as possible and then disseminate it out uh, to everybody. Uh, so so it probably wasn't so difficult, although, of course, um, nothing ever seems difficult once you're finished. Um, you know, banging your head against a wall, as they say, uh, feels a lot better when you stop. So um, I, I would encourage anybody really to, uh, uh, you know, to put their mind to contributing. You know, long before I wrote my first book, I contributed by writing articles and giving talks then. It's only, it was only in my later years, and of course so that's 20 years since Cold the Racers, that I actually started to do books. You know, we don't, not all our information has to come from books. So anybody that's keen 
uh, and wants to contribute in the written word uh, really should start by writing articles. We have a number of good um, barrier journals in the world and, and you know they always need material. You'll always be uh, welcomed when you, um, uh, you know, if you write for them. All right, let's see. <clears throat> well, we've got the deep philosophical question here almost. What is one of the most important or valuable lessons you'd like us to take away from this publication? Um, I hope that in a book the size of, of The Hoof of the Horse, there'll be quite a lot of things you take away. Um, but I think um, it is the physiology of the hoof, which I've looked into, I think, in more uh, detail than perhaps previous authors. So in other words, how does the hoof work? Physiology really covers, obviously it comes from the word physical, so it covers how something works, but it also uh, covers um, how it grows, how it develops, and how it reacts. So I'd say the biggest thing in the, in the hoof is that uh, when hooves change shape, we should figure out the reason why they change shape. And there's two reasons they change shape. One of them is a, a natural progression during development. And if we understand that, we don't worry about it. Uh, the other time they usually change shape is when something's going wrong. And that's either in the foot or it's uh, in the leg. Um, so, uh, you know, if it's going wrong, uh, in the leg, then, then you'd say, well, how can we affect the hoof? How can we stop it? But I think by understanding how it reacts to loading, and that's a big part of the foot, a uh, big part of the foot, big part of the book, how it reacts to loading um, teaches us how to unload parts of the hoof and therefore correct them. Uh, there's sometimes a feeling that if a hoof is a certain shape, then that's its natural shape. Well, Depends what you call by nat what you mean by natural. You know, if, if a tree is blown over by the wind, then you could say, well, it's naturally uh, supposed to be laying on its side. No, it's just been blown over by the wind. And if somebody had propped it up, it might not have blown over. So I feel the same way about the hoof. That um, just because something is occurring, it, it doesn't mean it's inevitable. Any more than you know, we know that, that human people they get problems with their legs and those problems uh, continue to worsen. Uh, uh, loading is uneven through their leg and the condition worsens. Well, you wouldn't expect to say to somebody, that's how your leg's supposed to be naturally, get on with it. So, so there are things that we can do to reduce the detrimental effects of uneven loading. Now I've used the term loading quite a bit. People say, well, what's the difference between weight bearing and loading? All right. so. I weigh 75 kilos. All right, that's a little bit of a fib. But let's say, to make it easy, I weigh 100 kilos. Now you'd say, well, perhaps each leg bears 50 kilos of weight. But of course, like most people, I load one leg more than the other. So it's probably more likely that one leg takes 45 kilos and the other uh, 55 kilos. And so that's loading, um, that's the difference down either leg. Now it gets more complicated than that because of course um, our legs don't necessarily, our, our feet don't bear weight evenly across them. And that's the same with, with the horse. Although the horse has a far simpler hoof than us, it does not load its weight equally around the whole uh, uh, peripheral. And of course, it's also bearing a little bit of weight on the, on the sole where it attaches to the wall through the white line and, and the frog often uh, during loading and certainly during locomotion. So none of that is even, and that has a measurable effect upon the way, uh, upon hoof shape. Um, I think I'm going to uh, just look to see uh, if we've got any more questions here on the screen, and I can see uh, that Sergio Moya, who recently uh, we went out to Spain together to the wonderful, wonderful city of Sevilla uh, to give a bit of a clinic out there. Sergio says, do you look into the influence of different environments on the hoof? Yes, I do, Sergio. We have a whole chapter on the effects of the environment upon the hoof. 
and uh, there's quite a discussion there. Uh, obviously, I couldn't give all the examples, but we know that the, the horse ranges uh, across the whole world apart from the Antarctic, so from the, from the desert to the wetlands of, of Wales, uh, and from uh, you know the tropical climate, uh, and then of course beautiful prairie type climates, which is where the horse came from. And all those affect the hoof. The other thing we sometimes ignore is that the biggest creator of the environment, especially for the horse, is us as human beings. You know, we stable them, we put them in paddocks that we've decided what's, you know, what grows in the paddock or whether they're on a, in a barn. So we actually have the biggest uh, uh, environmental influence upon them. And, and that does affect the hoof. Um, and it affects the hoof not just from the amount of moisture, but whether we're putting them in environments where there's lots of microbes. So yeah, um, it, it, I thought it deserved a whole chapter in the hoof of the horse. And I hope I've covered that um, uh, as completely as possible. I, mean, I would say that when it comes to uh, writing a book, I think if any of you who are listening to this uh, wrote the same book as me and sat down and said, I'm going to write a book on the hoof, you would come up with different things. So I'm not saying that everything that is important to the horse's hoof is in, in the book. That is, is not possible to do that. Um, you know, this is my book written by me, and it's what I think is important. And probably in a month's time, a month after the launch, if you ask me, you'll prob I'll probably say, I wish I'd said something about this. But that's the nature of writing a book. I think it's the most comprehensive um, book ever written on the horse's hoof, um, but that doesn't mean it's entirely exhaustive. So that leaves room for all of you out there to contribute more knowledge uh, and so that we have this collective uh, you know uh, bulk of of knowledge between all of us now liz coltman and i know liz because she has a lovely horse um and it's only about 30 minutes away from here and liz says actually liz has also got a racehorse and she's rather successful with it but her own horse that she rides she says my question is as horse owners, what do you think is the best diet for a horse to ensure healthy hooves for our horses? I have to tell you, I know this sounds like a cop out. There is a big, big uh, section in, in the um, Hoof of the Horse on nutrition. I've always worked with professional people and professional owners. And so I quite understand that there are many horses in, in some parts of the world or some parts of the UK who, who would need to advise uh, their owners how they should feed their horse. Um, if I did that with my clients, I can tell you, even at this stage of my career, I would probably be shown the, um, uh, the gate and the way out. Uh, so I, I think most horses, I'd have to say in the Western world, are, sh uh, are fed a pretty balanced diet. Um, and I, I understand those that are trying to sell hoof supplements uh, will tell you that they all need a hoof supplement. Uh, that's not my opinion. I'd have to say that there's very few horses that, that have poor hooves because of a lack uh, in nutrition. Um, that, that might not be, make me popular, as I say, with those that sell, sell those products. Uh, but that's my opinion, that, that most horses that are well looked after have actually a quite well-balanced diet and they therefore have the building bricks. Now there are other things that of course uh, that they digest that may well have uh, detrimental effects uh, upon the hoof and um, you know they, they can actually uh, should we say eat too much of some minerals and those have an effect on the hoof. Um, you know selenium is, is, is one of the obvious ones um, but actually from a point of view of advising on nutrition I I wouldn't do that. There is a lot on how nutrition affects the hoof of the horse in the book, but I'm not going to directly tell somebody that. Uh, let's see, what else do we have? Um, uh, well, Rick, Rick asked me whether, um, uh, whether I, um, 
he says, when, when I was writing and researching this book, has it made you change the way you think, approach anything in regards to shoeing or trimming with a different view? Uh, yes, it, yes, it has. Um, it's made me, for example, um, I can show quite clearly and I can show a graph how, how the uh, angle, the dorsal hoof wall angle changes during life, throughout life. Um, and therefore we should assess a 15 year old horse the same as we would a three year old horse. Um, and we should think about the way we trim it um, because of that. It's actually even more uh, dramatic with very young horses. Um, but you'll see that, you'll see there's a really nice graph which gives this beautiful curve. Uh, well, it doesn't go up, but it just comes down um, through the horse's life on the hoof wall angle. And of course, the, the, hoof, the dorsal hoof wall angle is very important to us. Um, that's probably uh, the way we judge the horse most of all our hooves, um, certainly from the side view and, and along with the hoof past and axis. And that's been going on for over 2,000 years. Um, uh, General uh, Xenophon, the great, great Greek uh, equestrian um, master, he he wrote about that in the earliest known writings on, on, on horse confirmation. So it was important then when they were selecting horses for the Greek cavalry, and it's uh, important to this day. So, so that was one of the things that I think has changed the way I look at the, the hoof. So uh, Tina has asked, can clips shape the coffin bone over time? Okay, well, I, I already spoke about the Krenner and people often use the Krenner as, a, as um, proof that having toe clips has caused this damage when, of course, it's naturally occurring and, and, and horses, um, I, I don't think foals are born with them, but they do acquire them uh, during maturation and they often acquire them uh, before they've had any shoes on, whether clipped or not. Um, there is the thought, of course, about, uh, about side clips or quarter clips and how restrictive those are and, and do they change the, the pedal bone? Well, I haven't seen uh, gross changes on x-rays. I would be open to anybody um, able to, to point to evidence um, that that is so. But uh, to put your mind at rest, Tina, uh, those little um, indents in the coffin bone are not caused by clips. Um, Robbie has uh, come back to us and Robbie has said, how much of a contribution does genetics play in hoof quality and would nutrition override or improve it? Oh, well, we're back to nutrition again. Um, I, I mean, I think even as a lay person, you know, I didn't study genetics um, from a PhD or even my, uh, my degree before that. But I think all of us, over the last 20 years since the, the, the um, uh, DNA has been able to be ana analysed uh, so well, uh, can see that the conclusion is that genetics is everything. Everything is genetics. Now, but uh, there's often a thing about a, shall we say, a brood mare with a club foot. Is she then going to breed foals with club feet? You know, you need tens of thousands of, uh, uh, of, of um, samples or of horses to study to actually get answers to that. That's one of the problems with genetics. You do need so much. Um, but I would say that when I did my Bachelor of Science degree and I was looking at flexural deformities and club feet, although I did it over four years, there was only about six mares that actually had four foals. Um, so they had a foal every year during my study. And uh, they, though, of those, they either had no folds of the club foot or they had two or three. Now that's a very small group and you can't jump to conclusions from that. But that might just suggest um, that there is quite a, uh, an influence of genetics. But that doesn't mean we can't do everything that's right to stop a horse getting a club foot. So we can beat genetics, which I think is at the heart of the question, um, but it does require um, our, our breeders to have us looking at the foals from a month of age and to be working on them and not to leave things until they're a year old or so and then call the farrier in or call the hoof trimmer in uh, and think that you can change things then. And of course, 
I think the people that will tell you that they can fix a club foot when the horse is three, four or five years old, I'm never quite sure whether they're trying to um, fool the horse owner or they're deluding themselves. But I, I believe quite strongly that foals get club feet um, uh, between the ages of 20 days and 110 days. Uh, oh, sorry, they get a flexural deformity, I should say, and they will have a club foot before they're 200 days of age. So this is the time you have to be working on them. And I also strongly believe you can stop them. So you can overcome some genetically produced or probably genetically produced conditions. So Stephen Hill, uh, who uh, gained his fellowship in the last few years, asks, is the pedal bone in foals symmetrical at birth? If so, what do you believe causes asymmetry in the pedal bone in older horses? Stephen, you know this is a book on the hoof, but I'm still going to answer it. Uh, one of my findings uh, within my PhD is that foals are born with symmetrical hooves and probably symmetrical pedal bones. Now, when I say probably, they look symmetrical to me, but it wasn't part of my study, so I didn't go and measure 100 pedal bones to give you an answer. <clears throat> so, so it is a good question. If they're born uh, symmetrical, and I'd have to say foals are also born with paired hooves, so left and right is paired. So we know, I mean, how many of our horses that we see every day have a perfect pair of hooves and those hooves are perfectly symmetrical? Well, for a start, healthy hooves are not perfectly symmetrical. But how many horses have the perfect pair? I think it's so rare that I know that, that farriers will remark on it. They'll say, I shot a horse today and got a perfect, perfect pair of hooves. So one of the big questions in my book is, if they start with symmetrical hooves, and if they're perfectly paired, what happens? Is it something we do? Is this a natural progression? Uh, is it caused by something else? The fact that we don't end up with horses with perfect pairs and perfectly symmetrical hooves. Now, actually, this is the first question I think I'm not going to give you the answer to it, even when I know the answer, because it's such a big part of the book. And I hope, and I, I'm, I'll be disappointed if I haven't explained this quite well in the book, both what's happening naturally and healthily, and what happens when it's not natural or healthy, when, when we actually have a condition that's, that's changing things. Sorry about that, Stephen, but um, I'm sure you can wait until your book arrives. It might have arrived already, actually. We've, we've had some people asking about books. Uh, there was an initial batch went out uh, last week, as soon as they came in, and I have been signing books all weekend, and they've all gone out today. So those of you that specifically requested signed books, uh, even you, as long as you're not too far away, we'll get them in the next couple of days, and one would hope that we've beaten the Christmas post, that we're getting them out early enough. But even those of you as far away as the States and Australia and New Zealand and South Africa will be getting them within the week, I hope. Um, that, that's what we aim to do. So let's have a look. Philip Martin says, can we correct asymmetric front feet in folds? OK, well, we're more, we're back to that again. One is more upright than the other. I've noticed an increase in the number of sports hawks sports horse foals with this okay um although i probably shod more sports horses than people would give me credit because they tend to think i've only ever done race horses um i i know that there there's actually been a campaign with especially in, in holland on the sports horses the um dutch warm bloods to try and improve that and that's why there's been certain work come from especially the university of utrecht in holland on why horses have um, uneven hooves. And actually my, uh, my director of studies, Sarah Hobbs, has been involved in some of that and, and, and I think still is. Um, it's always hard, you know, sometimes we imagine that there's an increase or not. And that's, of course, again, where science comes in. If these things are actually counted, uh, then we have no doubt. But um, uh, the other thing is it, it's uh, how do you define odd footed um i i usually go by that odd footed is three degrees of difference um and actually that doesn't sound a lot but i can assure you that if a horse is is 20 or 30 meters away and it has a difference in that sort of, of degree of three degrees in the dorsal 
hoofball angle, you will see it. So it is quite apparent at, at that amount. Um, so I don't know if there's an increase. Um, it may be that um, I think one of the causes of flexural deformity, uh, certainly in the thoroughbred world, is often put down to nutrition. You know, these uh, these foals live wonderful lives. They um, are fed everything they need, but sometimes, as with people, um, perhaps that's a bit too much. In other words, you don't see foals getting flexural deformities, acquiring the type that they get club foot uh, by uh, when they're when they're not well or when they don't do well. It's always these uh, foals that are doing well um, and have have a big top line, and um, they're the ones that tend to. Uh, uh, to get these so it is a sort of it's a condition of wellness i'm afraid as as is a number of things with horses all right alex uh, verner has asked me a question and he alex was an apprentice of mine he returned to his homeland of germany after a spell in the usa and he says would you say a dry environment is better than a moist environment do you know what i like with typical german precision that's a very simple question so I'll give that a simple answer. Uh, dry conditions are far better than wet conditions. You only have to ask uh, the people that shoe uh, in Scotland and Wales and parts of Wales where they, you know, up to their hocks in mud and you only got to look at their hooves. I always admire those guys because anybody that can shoe well in those wet conditions can shoe anywhere. If we compare that with, shall we say, the Eastern Mediterranean or the Western States of America, where they uh, have a far drier climate, then hooves always seem stronger. And where I was recently uh, in Andalusia, uh, Sevilla, if you look at the, the horse's hooves and it, not depending at all on the quality of the hoof care they get, they really have strong, good hooves. Well, I've got uh, Leanne here. And Leanne, um, I'm actually seeing her mares tomorrow so it's nice of her to come on board and join us and leanne says does the bedding we use have an influence on the growth shape of the foals of foals feet uh, and what they develop into especially with thoroughbreds born in january february time having increased time in the stables instead of the paddocks all right well that's a long question that covers a number of things uh, the first thing is does bedding affect who's the quality of who's well just like i say um the dry environment is good for who's I personally think that wood shavings is the best thing for your horse's hooves. Um, I've had horses on all types of, and, the, and the strongest hooves I've had is on wood shavings, mainly because uh, if they come in sloppy wet, they seem to dry on that um, quite well. And, and it seems to be a very kind uh, surface and possibly it, it, I don't know, it, maybe it has less microbes in it. So, um, does it influence, uh, does the bedding we use influence the hoof growth and shape of the foal's feet, what they develop into? Um, I, I don't think it, it probably does either um, in, in my experience, but I do think that uh, when, when we breed thoroughbreds, and of course there are some born in January and quite a few in February, um, and they often go in barns because of the bad weather, um, it's quite obvious that foals born in March so you'd think that they're, they're two months behind, catch up with them very quickly and because of their less development. Um, I did see some signs that uh, the, the later foals in the season uh, did do better uh, later on from a point of view of acquiring flexural deformities than earlier on in the season. And I can't explain that, but that was just a finding and it's from 10 years ago from my Bachelor of Science on uh, struggling to remember the exact results, but I remember seeing that effect. Um, what's causing it? Um, you know, we can guess at that, that it is a lack of exercise. Um, I don't. I think it's probably not the going that they're on or the, the substrate what's under their feet. Uh, Simon Moore says, "Well, he says very kindly after all your success during your career, what keeps you motivated to continue to learn?" Um, people like you, Simon Moore, that's what keeps me motivated. Okay, that was a little bit um, sycophantic and totally untrue. Um, I don't know, I think I've been passionate about the hoof. Um, 
I love the job. I meet lots of interesting people. I've been lucky to shoe lots of uh, wonderful horses. And of course, wonderful horses aren't ne necessarily expensive or highly successful. You know, they're, they are loved horses. So, um, you know, I, although I've um, been a farrier, I've now entered my 47th year of being a farrier. And of course I have, despite what I said earlier, that 90% of my work has been with the thoroughbred and I've lived in the new market area all my life. But, you know, I, I have continued to move my, my career forward from taking the various exams uh, to getting involved in examining, to traveling and lecturing uh, and, and to writing. So I think that's what's kept my enthusiasm. Uh, that's why I encourage everybody to do a little bit of these things, because I, I know it's a cliche, but there's always a reason for cliches uh, because they have an element of truth in them. And it's a cliche. Uh, that you only get out what you put in and suppose so i suppose i've got a lot out of this uh, profession and, and remain motivated because you know i put something back in uh okay now i need to find some more questions and and probably because we're hitting seven o'clock and seven o'clock is the watershed so i think you wait until you see this bottle of sparkly that we've got so uh one of uh, my hundreds of workers is, is trotting off down to the far end of the book factory and is just about to get us um, this. Let me just show you this bottle first of all. Now, if you're going to do the golden book, I think you have to celebrate it with a golden uh, bottle of Prosecco. Any of you there from Italy, can I personally say thank you for inventing this drink? Uh, and we're going to enjoy a little bit now. So I hope the pop doesn't um, does not um, distract too much and doesn't blow any of the books off the shelf behind me. Uh, okay, I've got Joe Hosey, and I don't know who Joe is, but uh, he says, "What's your opinion on graduated shoes crushing heels?" Okay, uh, it has been well recognised, um, I think, anecdotally, and of course that means just. Um, that, that we haven't actually measured it, but we recognise it because there's enough of us think it happens and, and there's nothing wrong with that at all. Um, and so, so most farriers who have used uh, graduated shoes would believe there's some crushing going on. And I did a little um, experiment or demonstration just, just for a lecture where I actually built up the heels and, uh, and I can see that Adam Meehan has joined. So Adam did it with me when he was my apprentice. And we used uh, uh, a polymer glue that we could peel off as soon as we finished uh, uh, doing it. And we built up the heels and we put the horse on the pressure mat. And it was quite interesting. It showed how it increased the pressure at the heels, uh, which we not shouldn't be surprised about. But it also increased it at the toe. It was in between it didn't increase it. So if you imp increase the pressure, then, of course, now that we know that hoof compressors, we shouldn't be surprised that the heels reduce. So does that mean we should never, ever, ever uh, either elevate or graduate uh, the, or use graduated heels? I, I think a lot of um, shoeing is a compromise. And of course, that compromise, um, we have to decide on an individual case by case basis. We know it's going to crush the heel, but do we gain something uh, prior to that? For example, if we have an injured tendon, do we help the tendon and say, look, I know it's going to have a detrimental in a long, over a long period on the hoof, but we're going to have to trade that off. That's for us to decide on individual cases. The other thing that we can do now, of course, is to support the frog, because most of it is, a lot of it's being caused because we, we've removed the frog from engaging the ground, and therefore it allows a prolapse more. So if we can find a way of, of increasing the pressure through the frog, then we can reduce that, that um, detrimental effect of elevating the heels. And of course, uh, there's a number of ways of doing that. Uh, and I think that the easiest way now is by using frog support pads. But the important thing is the underfill. And I like to use the PM pads and I like to underfill with dental impression material. And I think if you do that, you mitigate some of those effects. But it's a very good question and it is a reminder to us all that uh, a lot of showing horses is about um, is about compromise and and i'd i'd hope that that's part of the reason 
for my book that um that, that it, it gives you the knowledge and you make the decision about the compromise now i don't want anybody do uh, to, yeah i think i've got to pop it i no, but okay. what i mustn't do is get any over the laptop so we're gonna point it this way oh i haven't got the strength here we go here we go it's just about to weigh there we go so this is this is wonderful and to think i'm getting paid to do this not a lot really but um <laughs> so cheers so i hope you'll enjoy me with this glass of champagne i've got the real thing you have got oh cheers see the party's just about to start um uh, you've got a virtual one or i hope some of you are in the pub and um and having a drink it just flashed up on here there's been 160 comments now i'm really sorry if I'm, there's only so many i'm getting through and they are going down like nobody's business they're really going down the screen so i can only apologize if i don't get you what we'll probably try and do is catch up with some of them uh in the next few days mm. very nice too as i say thank you italy um okay um well liz has a supplementary question what's the most interesting thing that you learned when you were completing your research into the book you'd have thought i would have thought about this before i came online um what's the most important yeah see i start to sound very nerdish when i answer these um i i think i learned more about uh, the horn tubules sorry that does really sound uh nerdy um you know i think the pattern's very important to us we we don't quite understand the pattern we do understand more uh that horn tubules are cylindrical um and therefore they add stiffness to the hoop wall and that ought to make us wary about destroying some of the hoop wall um I, so i think i think i learned that i'm not saying that when you have a great big flare at the toe that you don't cut that off but i think we should really be wary about over rasping the toe there's other ways that we can if that's what we we think we're doing improving breakover there's other ways that we can do this um, we can uh, you know do it by the style that we trim uh, the dorsal uh, wall where it, where it meets the ground we can do it um, by the way that we fit our um, uh, our shoe and the design of the shoe so uh, i think i learned that um, I, you know, I'm going, I'm going a bit blank on this. I think um, uh, th there's an awful lot of things that I learned, um, and I should have perhaps made a list because I suppose now I read it, it's a fairly obvious question. So I'm going to move on, um, and uh, let's see what else we got. I'll see if I can move this. I, I'm not sure how we move it down since I've been left by one of my workers. Um, okay uh florian says sometimes we find healthy front feet that are wider than than long horses don't seem to have problems and the feet look besides the shape healthy what causes the hoofs to be that wide okay that's an interesting one um if one hoof is wider than the other uh, then that's because they're bearing more weight on it that's fairly straightforward um so we get what's sometimes called the high low um who shape and 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 the wider foot is being loaded more of course there's a question why is it being loaded more and that's usually one of two reasons one is that the more upright foot and leg um, has had an injury even if we don't know it um, or from the past and um, the other the other one is is that one leg is slightly shorter than the other and that's the more upright hoof. Uh, of course that calls into question that if we now try and correct this we now load our flatter hoof more, our wider hoof, and that increases it. So, so we need to think about that. But, but I've I've shown um, a couple of examples of that in in my new book. Um, how you deal with it afterwards is up to you. Um, I think some obviously some horses have a far wider hoof shape. You know, we've only got to think about horses like the Clyde stuff. The thoroughbred has a wider hoof shape than an Andalusian. You know, so. Um, so there are breed types, and there's also is the environment affecting that when it's when it's both feet. All right, 
Hannes from, uh, I'll probably not pronounce that right, have I, Hannes? And I always struggle with your name like that. Uh, I, I'm not sure if you're still in South Africa, but he says clients always ask if white horn hooves are softer than darker horn hooves. Any parts of your book covering this general question? Let me have a sip while I have a think about that, Hannes. And yes, I do cover it. Okay, I'll tell you what scientifically has been found. When they were tested, and I'm trying to think who tested it, it may well, I'm not sure, I don't think it's Doug Leach. When it was tested, uh, hooves of um, white hooves, pigmented hooves and unpigmented hooves uh, were tested uh, for their, um, uh, their uh, modulus of elasticity. So in other words, they bent until they break or they stretch until they break. And there wasn't a difference found. Now, that um, really goes against what most people working with hooves think. So where do we go from there when we have a scientific test that, that actually uh, contradicts, shall we say, uh, dogma? Um, I think there's a couple of reasons why this might, uh, why this finding might have come about. One of them, of course, is that what you do in a laboratory is not the same as what happens in life. And so you can bend things and you can stretch them and you can compress them, but things are more complicated than that on the hoof. Uh, you know, gathering your, just gathering your samples means that you change things to some extent. The other thing, of course, is that, that maybe it is so and that, dark, that light hooves are just as strong as dark hooves. And we have to say, well, why do we think it's different? And people will say there's more cracks in light hooves. Of course, the answer to that is that maybe we see them more easily because they're on light hooves. So I know I continue, as somebody who's worked in the industry for 47 years to, or I'm in my 47th year, to believe that uh, dark hooves are stronger than light hooves. Uh, as I say, the few, or the one study that's been done on that contradicts it. So I'll leave it to you, but of course it is covered uh, in this book. Uh, I see we've now hit 195 comments. That's pretty good. So congratulations to all of you uh, for showing such an interest. Um, uh, John Blake, who I mentioned earlier because he, he, he um, I, I saw him trimming some of the feral horses uh, on the uh, Wiccan Fen uh, Reserve. Uh, and John says, hi, Simon, what effect does a lack of turnout or exercise have on an immature hoof capsule? All right, well, that's an interesting question because, uh, for example, one of, the, um, uh, one of the treatment options for a flexural deformity, and, and I certainly always recommend this, is, is two weeks in a stable. Now, I think a fold can go two weeks in a stable and not a lot changes. But when you think it's a developing animal, what about if it's in the stable for two months? Uh, how does that, um, affect the hoof and how does it affect it athletically you know if you that's the equivalent should we say of a 10 year old child laying in bed for three months and then you expect them to be an olympic athlete it's not going to happen is it it's unlikely so what effect does it have on the hoof well hooves definitely uh, grow quicker uh, when they are standing about and not subject uh, to compression um, they obviously they don't um they don't wear so they get longer or unless the unless the, the horse is scraping the bottom of the stable bedding but uh, they don't wear and of course there's always a build up of the sole and the sole uh, in a in a healthy horse in a typical environment exfoliates so there are a number of things that happens um i'm not sure if i would be able to say that uh, for example, which I wonder if is behind John's question, that they contract. I think um, if we look at folds, of course, and it is, it is shown in the book, and it wasn't me that discovered it, but um, I've certainly written about it extensively, that actually young folds have a, a hoof shape that's an inverted cone for about three or four months of their life, which is very interesting. You know, if we accept that a mature horse has a, a cone-shaped foot, so uh, young foals have an inverted cone. So I explain in that uh, why that occurs, and I would hope it would um, put people's minds at rest when they see it, because certainly if they don't see lots of foals, uh, 
some of them are more striking and more marked than others. And, and it really takes you when you suddenly see this and think, uh, my goodness, what's going on there? Okay. So we're going to have, Jürgen says he can't wait to read it. Well, you won't have to wait much longer, Jürgen. Uh, they're, all, they're all going out. So Jürgen's asked, asked another question here. Uh, he says, what's your opinion, Simon, about locomotion observation by a quick eye system, high speed cam computer system? The understanding of development of Harry. All right, we're getting away a little bit from the hoof of the horse. Um, no, I, I think one of the one of the marvelous uh, innovations in the last ten years or so is, is that there are these systems, and even on your iPhone, um, I think. Um, oh, I'm going to forget the name of it. There's an app, I think, Coach Eye, or um, where you can film horses and look at them in slow motion. So of course we learn a lot more. Uh, we learn about how the hoof comes to the ground. Um, and we actually can see some of the effects of loading. Um, so I think it's all good. I think it, it, at this present time, it's unlikely that very many farriers will use it, um, should we say, in their everyday practice, because it takes time. And, you know, somebody's got to pay for that, either the client or you're paying with your time. So, so I'm not sure what the practical use of, at this moment of uh, video analysis in everyday work, but from the point of view of research and then and then passing that research back to us and the findings, uh, then I think it's marvellous uh, what's happening now. So uh, Derek Bupard, and I think Derek is back in Dubai, and he sent me a very nice congratulations from Dubai earlier. Derek's South African, but he has worked for Godolphin for many a long year. And he said, uh, I have had good trips to NM, and I'm not sure whether uh, that must mean Newmarket and to meet up and have interesting conversations with you and Beverly over dinner at Abington Place. Uh, I'm planning to do some more next summer. Looking forward to reading the horse's hoop. All right. So that's not a technical question, Derek, but I can't wait to see you. And I actually think that's um, I think that's uh, Declan Cronin saying that uh, through Derek because because Declan is more of a technophobe than me. So um, I think that's what's happened there. Uh, Declan's uh, out in, in Dubai and I've known Declan for many a long year. So, so we're gonna discuss things uh, next summer. He often comes over to Newmarket, didn't see him this summer. Um, so I missed my free meal, which you know was a big disappointment to me. Now, Liz has come back. Liz is very keen on these questions. And she says, is there a breed of horse that in your experience has worse feet than other breeds? As we mentioned earlier, the Andalusian breeds have good hooves. Uh, I'm not sure if I said they're good hooves. They certainly have more upright hooves, but, but the quality of the hoof is, is good. Um, you know, the thoroughbred has, has such a bad name for having uh, poor hooves. And yet all over the world, I've seen well cared for thoroughbreds with very good hooves. I think it just requires uh, the farriers to accept the shape a little bit more, not impose their shape on, on them as much. But of course, the one, um, the one breed that is renowned for having a genetic disorder, which has been proven, uh, is the Connemara. And that genetic disorder is hoof wall separation syndrome. For, for any of you who haven't seen it, uh, then it, it, it shells, the, the hoof shells off about halfway up the hoof, and it's shelling off mid. Uh, stratum medium, stratum medium being the main body of the hoof wall. Um, so of course, here is this this horse now without a hoof wall all the way around uh, uh, to to load bear on the ground. So of course, it, it causes lameness and it causes problems to everybody. Um, I've got a picture in in uh, hoof of the horse of uh, of one I saw. Sorry if the hoof's a bit muddy, but. Um, uh, and I also have one, uh, another one with some quite poor hooves as a youngish yearling thoroughbred where it's breaking up and where there's actually um, the, the, the walls coming apart a little bit. So, so I think um, breed probably does have an effect on, on quality of horn. 
Um, I take it as slightly as a personal affront when everybody names the thoroughbred. In fact, the one thing that we know about the thoroughbred is that it does have a thinner hoof wall than other breeds. Um, it has thinner skin, probably a thinner temperament, um, but it has it does have a thinner hoof wall, and that's maybe one of the reasons why athletically uh, it's so fast. I remember uh, reading a book on the horse, a very good um, book, and uh, in it, the author said that if you cross the thoroughbred with any other breed, you will you will improve its performance. You'll in, whether it, you want something to jump, it will jump higher. You know, of course, if you want it to run, it will run faster. But you will improve it athletically. And I thought, yes, you'll improve it apart from its hooves, and the hoof, you'll screw its hooves up. But that's just the you know that's the nature of that breed. As I say, it definitely has a, a it has a, um, a lower angle. And it does have thinner hooves, but uh, I see, as I say, thoroughbreds everywhere with really strong, good hooves, including the hoof that's on the front cover of the book. This is actually a retired racehorse, um, and it's actually the grandson of uh, Shirley Heights, which some of you that follow British or European racing will know that Shirley Heights uh, won the Derby, or to you in America, won the Derby. Um, and uh, I was a bit worried when I first shod uh, Bob, uh, knowing that he was the grandson of Shirley Heights, who I have to say I shod her at Shirley Heights at stud, not, not in training, not when he won the derby. Um, and he was, uh, as we diplomatically say, he was quite a character. All right, let's have a look. We've got Christopher James, Graham, Rab Johns. Uh, had a custom with hoof wall separation. Long story short, the horse was put down. Tried everything. Uh, Christopher actually says tired everything here. I think I would be tired if I had to do that. Do you know what? I, I often say to owners, for example, about club foot, no horse ever died of a club foot. It's a real bit. I don't think any horse dies of a hoof wall separation. So it's a pity that there wasn't another home found for it. But um, I think genetically we we can't cure it, but you know with 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 the modern glues we can repair. Now we need an owner that's prepared to do that every three months, but we can repair the hoof wall, um, and I've certainly had to do that. Uh, and then you can, if you wish, you can you can chew traditionally or you can leave it unshot. But it is uh, totally possible to repair, and uh, you know with acrylics and fiberglass cloth, and you can do a good strong repair. That, that lasts quite a few months. So it's a pity if it, if it was put down. Okay, so all I really need to know is if there's any last questions, because we're pretty much at the bottom, and I'm so, sorry if I've missed anybody, uh, because uh, I, I certainly have tried to get through them. It's been quite difficult, because actually there's been so many of you, as I say, well above any of our expectations, and they've been, you've been really ticking on down and, and as you probably could see, sometimes I went to ask a question and it slightly disappeared. And uh, I had to ask one of my multitude of uh, employees here in, in the book factory uh, to come and, and let me out. There you go. That was one of the many. Um, all right. So I'm not sure if there's any more uh, for me to say. We're just having a quick look. Um, to see if there's anything. What does Paul Brennan say? Simon, is the colour of the hoop capsule not related to the colour of the pigment of the skin proximal to the coronary band, as the hoop capsule is a continuation of the skin, but is keratinized to give more strength? Nice one, Paul. Good point. Um, yes, it is. Actually, one of the things that you might be interested in, somebody asked me earlier what I found that was fascinating, and this is a bit nerdish. You know, most foals are born with just light coloured feet, even when they've got um, darker hair at the top. And uh, the foal's hoof changes from the day they're born. So they're born with one colour and then they change the, um, the, the colour of their, their hooves. Um, and it, I think it's an oversimplification to say that hoof is keratinised um, hair, but of course, I think it is, though, you can imagine that exactly where the hair line stops. Uh, so this hair is down here, and then where it stops, 
suddenly it's grown as hoof. It's definitely, it is modified hair to some extent, uh, the hoof, but it's a bit of an oversimplification to say that. But one thing I learned when I was measuring hoof growth, uh, and I learned this off Professor John Riley, was that, that um, you are far more accurate if you measure from the hairline than the coronary band. And the reason for that is all of us know where the coronary band is. Ask a barrier, ask somebody, a hoof care professional, where's the coronary band? You put your finger on it. But you ask somebody to show them you exactly where the coronary band ends and the hoop all starts, and that's not so easy. But you know the hairline is always very accurate. So, uh, so I used to do all my uh, measurements from, from the hairline, which is where the hoof underneath uh, starts to be generated. All right, I think we've got one more. Uh, what does uh, uh, Mark trust the well, Mark? Have you just got out of bed, Mark? Anyway, I was expecting you earlier. I have to thank Mark. Uh, Mark was the person who I had three reviewers of my book um, to, in other words, to copy proof the book. And uh, Mark is thanked in here. Your name's in here somewhere, Mark, uh, because you did a great job and you reviewed the book and uh, you uh, pointed out the two spelling mistakes that I've made. So thank you. For that mark um, but you were a great help and you will get your your i'll get the words out now this this uh, uh prosecco must be stronger than i thought um you will get your reward in heaven okay mark trussler's question and it is going to be the very last question is uh what is your favorite thing about the hoof and why oh i wish i i wish i hadn't gone on to that now what's the favorite thing about the hoof uh the favorite thing about the hoof well, I think in some ways is that something that we forget, a couple of things we forget, because we work with them all day. One of them is, you know, this is an animal that work, walks on the tip of its fingernail, of its middle fingernail. It's the only animal that does that. It's more like a spider from that point of view, that it has this extremely simple tip uh, to its leg. That's why I love it when I see people looking down at their foot when they're talking about a horse's hoof. We're at opposite ends of the extreme. We have more bones in our feet than any other mammal, and, and the horse has less than any other mammal. So that's one thing that's quite a favourite. It's, it's what met, has meant that the horse has this extraordinary athletic ability, um, but it also, of course, means that if something goes wrong with that one single digit, then the horse is in trouble, which is, is why our job is pretty important. The other thing I think that's always worth remembering is that we, that, that we forget how tough the hoof is. Hoof horn is one of the toughest biological materials. Just because we have nice nippers and a rasp and we've been working on it for years, that we find it easy to cut horn, we just forget just what the quality of hoof horn is. So I think that's one of the things to remind ourselves is that by and large, hoof is extremely strong, extremely healthy, and extremely successful. You know, um, we can get a bit carried away with the problems of the hoof and sometimes just forget that this is one of the most um, extraordinary examples uh, in the animal kingdom. One more, it's I'm told I've got to do one more question um, from Florian. Yeah. Okay. Charlotte von Zadow asked me to pose the following question. Charlotte, don't you come here on here on your own? Because I know you're a Facebooky. Now, before I read on, Charlotte came over from uh, Germany to help me um, uh, prepare all the all the all the hoof cuttings for my PhD. I don't know what it is about the Germans, but they are very, very good when it comes to uh, histology and looking down a microscope at the hoof. Um, so I, I went to the Free University, uh, and I know um, I think Charlotte's more attached to Leipzig or was, but or maybe that's Jenny Hardin, but some very good universities in Germany that, that, that look very carefully at the anatomy of the hoof. All right, Charlotte's question is, uh, yearlings that go to sales and then training often have rather upright feet when I see them years later as broodmare's feet. Sorry, often have rather upright feet. And when I see them years later as broodmare's, 
they seem to be wide and have flat angles. What causes this change? Well, I think partially I've already answered that, that there is a natural progression um, where the dorsal hoof wall angle does, does reduce uh, as the horse matures. So, so we have to take that into account. Now, horses in training, and I think this would go for any sport, when they're really um, exercised hard, then, then, then they do get, it to some extent, it's, it, it sounds dramatic to call it a type of laminitis, but I think many racehorses certainly come out of training and they, uh, they have sunk, and they've sunk not because they've had a systemic attack of laminitis, but because of this very hard exercise regime. So I think, um, I think it's a combination of two things. I think every mare that you see, however, um, however healthy, is gonna have a lower angle than it did when it was in training. And in fact, when it's in training, it'll have a lower angle than it was as a foal. And that was one of my big findings. And I hope I've explained that well in the book. So now I'm going to let you all go off to your own private parties and, uh, and celebrate this book. So have a drink on me. Um, I've got to thank all of you for coming. Uh, we've been quite overwhelmed. I can see that it's flashing up. But I've got six new comments. I don't really have time to uh, go through them. Robbie Miller, who is another technophobe from South Africa, actually says, hello, Charlotte. I hope Charlotte is watching. If, if she's not, Robbie, just send her a personal message, hey? Anyway, thank you to everybody for coming and joining in this celebration. Uh, those of you who have ordered books already, honestly, that, there's, there's, there's nothing sits in the warehouse at the moment. Uh, we get a huge new tranche of books coming in tomorrow. Another articulated lorry turns up and we're gonna start sending those out. Um, at the moment, you have 10% off of the book until Friday. So you just got to go on curtisfarriabooks.com. That's our main point of sale. If you want that discount, you've got to go on there before Friday. And we're going to announce the quiz winner tomorrow because we've been so busy and I didn't have anybody in my team I could trust to go through the answers. So I'm going to start looking at them uh, once we finish this. So once more, thank you very much. Cheers to you all. And here's to the hoof of the horse. Thank you. Bye.